It is 10 o'clock. Good morning. I'm Lucas Panzica from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. If you missed it, the news of the NFL on Wednesday, the Houston Texans acquired star wide receiver Stephon Diggs from the Buffalo Bills in a trade. The Bills receive a 2025 second round pick via the Vikings. The Texans also receive a pair of late round picks. Big game tonight at Bridgestone Arena. The Nashville Predators play at home before hitting the road to the Northeast. They host the St. Louis Blues. Puck drop set for 7 p.m. at Bridgestone. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Good morning. Welcome in a 104.5 The Zone. Hope everybody is off to a great start today. We're happy to have you here for the next three hours. 615-737-1045 is the number if you want to jump in with Lucas Panzeca and myself. We have a couple of special guests in studio today, bud, that actually beat me to the radio show today. Shocker. Shocking to nobody. Uh, we have Landon and Ashley in the house. If you're a Titans fan, you're probably familiar with the story. Uh, we may put you guys on a microphone here in a little bit if you're uh, so inclined. I know Landon is primed and ready. He's been ready to do the radio show for about 20 minutes longer than I have today. But we are happy to have them in with us. Corey Curtis of WKRN News 2 will be in studio as well here in the next couple of minutes. And we'll see what the latest is across the local sports scene. Talk a little Titans. Preds play tonight against the St. Louis Blues. They're going to try and continue their push for the postseason. In the meantime, uh, we can get into a variety of different topics. Lucas, where do you want to start today? Uh, because I'm already getting dragged in the f and Bank chat on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch with uh, the Landon greater than buck sign which is what I anticipated today, uh, really isn't even a debate. And frankly, I'm inclined to agree with them. He's got cooler wheels than you for sure. The Lightning McQueen kicks on the way up here. Pretty cool stuff. I uh, I could only aspire to be as cool as Landon, so I'm happy to have him in studio with me to bring up the cool factor around here. Uh, but let's start in the obvious place. The Texans traded for Stephon Diggs yesterday and you know we made a little bit of a scene about it understandably so the Texans continue to add to their arsenal on offense around a really really talented second year quarterback in CJ Stroud and what you have is a collection of skill position players now where I think we kind of treated treated it yesterday as a you can you can talk to me on air Luke because I have headphones sitting here uh with uh, with me for Landon, I just you know didn't give myself enough time to plug them in for him. No, no, you did not. <laughs> so you, if you want to come in here and do that, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Luke is trying to be professional and talk to me in my ear while I'm talking, but you know, since when are we professional around here? But anyway, Stefan Diggs. We talked about it as if as if it was the Texans acquiring a number one wide receiver, and. Stephon Diggs is a former All-Pro, though it's been a couple of years since his last All-Pro selection. I believe his only All-Pro selection in the COVID year 2020. He's now 31. 30 is typically the crossing over point for veteran wide receivers. Famously, DeAndre Hopkins does not believe in that. And based on last year's results, that was indeed the case. But after reading the stuff coming out of Buffalo, in particular, our friend Diana Rossini's reporting uh, from The Athletic, where you're looking at a situation for Stephon Diggs and the Bills where they just got to a point where they're tired of the passive aggressiveness. And he's no longer quite the player that he used to be, which, of course, is you know makes the headaches a little less worth taking if you're Buffalo. So we're going to get into a couple of different angles of this. And... 
do a little more pro-con stuff than we did yesterday because yesterday it was more about, all right, the Texans are trying to keep their foot on the gas. They understand that the rest of the AFC South, including the Titans, are trying to make this a mess in 2024. And you completely understand why they would continue with the kind of contract situations that they have to max out around C.J. Stroud. Stephon Diggs makes all the sense in the world for them and the price tag. Uh, a 2025 second and Houston receiving draft compensation in return for that 2025 second, in addition to adding Stephon Diggs, I think kind of speaks to the level of, you know, why not that is going on with the Texans franchise right now. But it's it still makes them dangerous. It still makes that offense hugely viable. And uh, I think for Texans fans, there's probably a little bit of concern. How much of his attitude, if you want to describe it simply as attitude, how much is that going to clash with what it is that the Texans are trying to execute? Because Stephon Diggs is famously one of these playmakers. Some of you might call them divas. Some of you might look at that and say, well, that's exactly what you want from a skill position player, from a running back, from, you know, a, a Tyreek Hill, uh, an A.J. Brown, a Devontae Adams. No, give me the ball if you want to win football games. And Stephon Diggs has plenty of that. But the point is, he's about to lose a ton of targets. And how that goes in Houston is going to be something that's worth talking about, worth watching over the course of the next couple of months. And I don't think it's as cut and dry as you want to make it, even though there's going to be a lot of discussions today about the Texans trying to equip themselves, and and rightfully so, equip themselves as Super Bowl contenders. Whether Stephon Diggs, Lucas, is the tipping point between the Texans being Super Bowl contenders or not being Super Bowl contenders, I think is the kind of stuff that we'll hear from Greg Cosell on today. We did a little bit of that on the install yesterday and, and kind of where he fits within the scope of their offense were we already talking about the texans as super bowl contenders well hell yeah they won I the division like, last year i feel like we were yeah they won a playoff game last year so if this doesn't put them over the top that's definitely what they're talking about in houston right they're not talking about okay let's just go win the afc south again they're talking about winning a super bowl in 2024 no absolutely as they should this is this is exactly when you're trying to max it out now we've talked about this the idea of how many teams actually win the super bowl with a rookie quarterback or a player on a rookie quarterback contract as cj stroud will continue to be for the next couple of years and honestly i think it works to will levis's benefit that he was a second round pick because it just means he gets to get to that payday sooner than the rest of them uh having a fifth year option attached to their contract so of course Houston is talking about them as Super Bowl contenders today. They're they're not going to they don't have to worry about is Stefan Stefan Diggs going to throw a hissy on the sideline when he's not getting enough touches in a game where they're trailing, I don't know what the Texans schedule looks like next year, but let's just say they're in a in a tight game on the road against the Titans and Stefan Diggs is on the sideline and he's saying, "No, throw me the ball. I'm your guy. I'm your top option. I've been the former I'm the former All-Pro." in the room when in reality Nico Collins is probably their number one wide receiver in Houston and Diggs might not even be two depending on how healthy Tank Dell is now if I remember correctly Tank Dell's injury was a broken leg um and that is reason enough to be concerned about a wide receiver because he was absolutely electric prior to the injury and of course he missed the rest of the year so we'll see how he kind of recalibrates from that. But if you're Houston, it's also kind of hedging your bets to just improve your wide receiver depth. What are you making faces about? It that was game? a fractured fibula. I forgot how serious the injury was to Tank Dell. Yeah, it's not ideal. It's not ideal if you're Houston. Um, so looking around at this, we'll, we'll talk about the viability of it throughout the course of today. Corey Curtis will join us in studio here in just a little bit. Uh, you'll hear from Rand Carthon later on. Are you nervous that college football is going to do the thing that uh, – English Premier League soccer or international soccer staved off, which is put together a Super League. No, I'm not, because they're not. There will be a Super League, don't get me wrong, in college football, but it will be on the terms of Greg Sankey and the SEC, as well as the Big Ten, not on this format that's been put together that seems to be a little out of their control. That is one of the biggest headlines coming out of today's news cycle, and certainly we'll get into it. Landon seems anxious to get on the microphone, Lucas. I think we should turn his mic on. All right, let's do it. Do you have the ability to do that? Landon, you're officially on the air. How are we feeling, bud? 
good. Yeah? Are you excited about this? Yeah. So how you you tell you told me that you watch the zone on your iPad a lot. Have uh, what's your favorite show? Careful. <laughs> you can be honest. Radio Star Wars. Star Wars? That's a great Legos answer. Which one? Which one? The Lego one. The Lego Star Wars. Okay, excellent. Who's your favorite character in Lego Star Wars? Darth Vader and the Stormtroopers. Oh, Darth Vader and the Stormtroopers. He's got my kind of vibe. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Landon, you're going to stick around with us and uh, talk some shop? Yeah. Okay, I'm excited for it. 615-737-1045 is the number. If you want to jump in, Lucas, I'm going to trust you with that microphone back there today, if you would be so kind. Uh, we're hanging out with Landon and Ashley in studio. We'll tell you more about their story here in a little bit. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone.
Welcome back to the show. Corey Curtis of WKRN News 2 going to hop in studio with us. We'll talk some shop here in just a little bit. Uh, Lucas, you want to play a little phone line Russian roulette before uh, you go grab Corey Curtis? Or we'll find out exactly who's on the phone lines. You can jump in if you want to. 615-737-1045 is the number. If you're watching on Zone TV, there's actual sunlight in the studio. My skin is starting to sizzle a little bit. It's not a, not something that I'm accustomed to. But Landon, who's hanging out in studio, he and his mom Ashley today with us for uh, for as long as they want to, as far as we're concerned, um, asked why the hell it was so dark in here. <laughs> I said it because I'm, I'm a little bit like a vampire. You can't have too much light on me. But we'll, uh, we'll get into some Titan stuff with Corey Curtis and talk more about the Stefan Diggs trade, the implications of it in the AFC South here in just a second. We can take your phone calls. In the meantime, Kyle is up first this morning. Hey, Kyle. Hey, Buck. Well, I kind of got a little upset about how you dismissed me so easily about, you know, Diggs being the number two and Collins being number one. But then I, I went to bed last night before I went to listen to Greg Cosell install with you, and he seemed to really back me up in what I think, that Diggs is not a deep threat, Collins is a true number one, going to break out, have more yards. Not gloating, but I'm just, I just got to say that. But it seems now the whole world's kind of saying, Diggs is a bad dude at cancer, and this is great for the Titans. I'm so glad we did not get him. <laughs> well, I haven't, I haven't seen quite that yet. Kyle uh, Lucas is making faces at me like he smells something bad. Kyle is alleging that Stephon Diggs is a locker room cancer. Um, and, you know, listen, it didn't – and I, I don't want to speak without being there specifically about how it ended, but it sounded like just a little contentious with Stephon Diggs and the way that the Bills uh, situation kind of devolved. And uh, what are you waving your hand? Turn your microphone on and, and tell me what you're waving your hands a, a in the air A little about. contentious. It's a little contentious. This guy's averaged 110 catches over the last four years, and they just sent him out the door. Yeah, well, they ate a ton of and money And they to ate $30 million. Dollars. Okay, that's not a little contentious. That's the Joker sitting on a pile of $25 million <laughs> and lighting it on fire just for the satisfaction of it. Speaking okay? of lighting things on fire, that's Corey Curtis of WKRN News 2, who's kind to, enough to, to join us in studio. To say slightly contentious, means like, you know, uh, it just wasn't working out between us. No, th- look, the guy made a gajillion dollars, one dollar for every derogatory tweet he put out about his quarterback, <laughs> which is one more than every other wide receiver does in the league. Corey, you should have heard him yesterday when I even brought up that idea. He said, oh, anytime a receiver looks emotional on the sideline, he's called a locker room cancer. Well, that is true. People get way too out of control with that stuff. People were going at De- DeAndre Hopkins and Kyler Murray a couple of years ago with that in-season hard knocks, that one clip that went around of them kind of jawing sure. at each other. On the sideline, the Diggs situation is different. My point, though, is Corey, different. is not not being there and not knowing the specifics of why it devolved because we know that he held out of training camp and we know that there were some issues with Josh Allen that they had to kind of that Allen had to answer questions about and that he's always been kind of this super emotive dude I I it's hard for me to get like too over the top with it even understanding as they ate 30 million dollars which is as much as any team has ever eaten to send a wide receiver away uh, look no I'm I'm not there um and you're not there. I, I know the decision that it was made. I know what it means. It means the situation was no longer tolerable, and there was only one person making that situation not tolerable, all right? And his name is Stefan Diggs, okay? And you look at his stats, and yes, he helped Josh Allen get to the next level. When did he average 110 catches? When he got to Buffalo. Look at his catches in Minnesota. It's only like in the 60s or 70s. Yeah, he was there with Thielen. Yeah. And, and yeah, but I mean, he went to Buffalo. He got the ball 50 more times a year. What on earth is he complaining about? I mean, he got paid. He gets the ball. He's on a good team. Yes. Throw he, it to him more, Corey. He lives more. in Buffalo. <laughs> and, you know, I understand if he wants to jump over Niagara Falls. I get it. Okay. You're in Buffalo. It's not a great place. Not my favorite. But. Then send out tweets about Buffalo, not about your quarterback. What is it? it, That is one of the things that I'm actually interested to find out more information about at some point because somebody's going to do some reporting on this, and I know the people in Buffalo already have started to, or at least have been since this became an issue. Um, I think. I think ultimately, though, that that about Josh Allen and how C.J. Stroud is going to manage this now, because you know, to the to the call or to the caller's point, 
Kyle brought up the idea of him not being the number one wide receiver. Nico's either. pretty good. Nico's Nico has been a late bloomer. Nico Collins is absolutely wide receiver one in Houston. Yeah. And we'll and, see what happens with Tank Dell. This feels like a Tank Dell insurance type of thing, though, coming off a of fractured sure. leg. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Tank Dell's good. He's just little. Um, but, yeah, and look, I mean, you want three weapons. I mean, before you had one pass rusher, now you've got two. And then you had one right receiver, too. Now you want three. I mean, because how many three receiver sets are they going to run? A lot. All right? And now you got to try to cover all of them. So, yeah, it's going to be a challenge to C.J. Stroud. And, and it'll be interesting to see how many targets – Stephon Diggs gets. You know, you look back at last year with the Titans, and, you know, everybody's upset with Traylon Burks, and I get it. It's been a disappointment to this point for one reason or another. But there was no doubt Will Levis was looking to DeAndre Hopkins all the time, always, and understandably so, because he doesn't have to be open to throw him the football. But Traylon never never said bleep about it, all right? Stephon Diggs, if he doesn't get the ball as many times as he thinks he should, doesn't matter who the quarterback is, he's made that clear. Yeah, He's going to let you know about it. Now, he's not been wrong in his entire career. He's not been wrong, but he's not You're quite, saying he's not wrong I'm now not about that. wanting the ball more well, than 110 times I a game? I don't know what he's going season? to look like moving forward because he has crossed the 30-year-old plane as a wide receiver, and he's not the same kind of player that he was at his all-pro height, what, okay, four years but ago. But see, you're saying something that he is not prepared to hear. No, of course not. Because if you told him that, he would punch you in the throat. But, Corey, I want a guy like that. That's the thing that drives me crazy. I, look, I want I, a dog that absolutely I, demands the ball. I do, I'm too, but I don't. I'm getting emotional. But I don't want a guy who's willing to flamethrower the entire team to do it. And that's what he's willing to do. When A.J. got in Taylor Lewan's face against the Kansas City Chiefs because he kept, kept getting false starts, kept getting sure. holding penalties, as a rookie... And kind of checked everybody in real time and let them that, know. That, hey, dude, that's I know fine. it's not the same thing, but I'm saying not. that. What? How much is too much then, Corey? Because I understand what you're saying you know about him is? being contentious when with the quarterback. When it's April and you're I putting out tweets about your need quarterback, a dude, to have that kind I, of fire. I want an alpha as well, and I want a leader as well. But there's effective leadership, all right, and then there's destructive leadership. And you're talking about a guy who's destructive. He's, he is trying to publicly humiliate the quarterback when there aren't even games going on. All right? Look, if you're, if you're after the game and the quarterback has a crap day and you say, look, we've all got to be better. I've got to be better. Josh has got to be better. You know, we have opportunities. He makes a lot of money. He's got to hit those. But to be sitting here in April and, and to go after your quarterback, why? 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 Oh, because Twitter's fun. Okay, it's fun, <laughs> but what do we also... No, I understand what, what you're all, saying. We, it's destructive. No, it it's, clearly it, caused a problem. It, it, yes. it clearly became contentious to the point where he's not quite the player that's worth and, and putting up also, with it anymore. It's also different to call out your left tackle, all right, than it is to undermine two people, your quarterback and your head coach, okay? Those are two people you can't undermine because there has to be absolute belief in both of those people for the thing to move forward. Houston, a better football team with Diggs. Sure, he's got more talent. Until he starts tearing it apart, they're better. Yeah. Your point about how he's going to respond to targets is absolutely well taken. That's the biggest question about how this is going to go and whether the second-year quarterback is capable of managing a situation like that. Yeah. Because if you if you make this move, it's more than just, uh, all right, the Titans have Legereus Sneed. Let's go and try and make their life a little bit harder. Because I think a lot of people, a lot of Titans fans, understandably because of the, the sequence of things, are looking at this almost as a response to Legereus Sneed being in the AFC South. I, I don't know that I quite conflate those things. I think that the Titans are in a hell of a lot better position to have I, I think the Texans, a chance in the AFC South now. Yeah, but the Texans want to win the Super Bowl. Agreed. That's what I think this move's about. I don't think this has anything to do with Legereus Need no, being on the Tennessee no, Titans. I, I, no, because if I'm the Texans, I don't view the Titans as my competition. I don't either. I view the Bengals, the Bills, the the Chiefs. The Ravens. The Ravens. That That's my competition. They're 10-1 to 1 to win the Super Bowl right now. So Vegas thinks they're a contender. All right, and if but Vegas is willing to put their money there, then then they should be pretty good. And so, they're yeah, they're not saying, well, the Titans have got Snead, we've got to answer that. They're only playing the Titans twice, and it's not going to be in January. What's the difference between C.J. Stroud and Trevor Lawrence, though? Because I've seen this story with the Jags very mm -hmm. recently, and Lawrence might be. Uh, I mean, C.J. Stroud might have already supplanted him as the best quarterback in the division, and it's uh, it's a lot of young dudes, and Trevor Lawrence is not the book is not 
closed on him yet. He's obviously still got plenty more years in the league to play, and he's he's a solid quarterback, but he's not anything special today. Look, he gets painted as a top-five quarterback, and I have no idea why. Well, people project. They yeah, want the Jags to be good because he's he, he was a quote-unquote generational prospect. I wish we would stop using that he, phrase. He, he, look, Caleb Williams is a generational prospect. Trevor Lawrence is not a generational prospect. He's a great prospect, without a doubt, but he's, he's not the prospect Caleb Williams and Andrew Luck were. All right, those guys, those are the last two quarterbacks I look at as generational prospects. Trevor Lawrence, really talented, really good career, but I never viewed him like I view this. Now, what, would I have made him the first pick? Yep, I, I absolutely would. Do I consider him a bit of a disappointment to this point? Yeah, I, I kind of do. I expected him to be better. Um, you know, obviously the first year was a disaster, you know, without a doubt, but he's had two I miss years. Urban Meyer. He's had two years under Coach Peterson. And the first one was really good, and the second one, you expected a step forward. And it was you, a lost season. And you kind of took a step back. Yeah. And and that was loaded with weapons. He had Calvin Ridley. He had Christian Kirk. Um, he had Evan Ingram. He's got ATN in the backfield. I mean, he didn't have any excuses. All right? Their meltdown, the end of the season last year, was so much more catastrophic than the Titans the year before because they didn't have the excuses that the Titans did. Well, we were surprised that the Titans were 7-3 and three when they were. Yes, and then the Titans are trying to do it with Josh Dobbs and a patchwork offensive line. They didn't have that excuse. They had Trevor Lawrence the whole way. They're rolling through with him, all right? So he, the, last year, it's not all on him, but he's the quarterback. It's his team. It's largely on him. And I think without a doubt, if you asked everybody in football, you can have one quarterback, C.J. Stroud or Trevor Lawrence, I, tell me why you're going to take Lawrence over Stroud. Oh, sure. Well, and it's not just about it's not just about Trevor. Like the fact that C.J. Stroud got a full year with Laramie Tunsil, and I know that he wasn't healthy for the entirety yeah. of the season, but still, like that you had the best left tackle in football helping your rookie quarterback succeed sure. at that rate, helped you stave off a bunch of different offensive line injuries that they had. So how do we view Indianapolis in the middle of all this? Because they basically – did what Chris Ballard always does. They saved all their money. They spent it on all their players. And, you know, I guess they're a solid football team. They won nine games with Gardner Minshew last they're eight year. They're 8-8, eight, right? They're 8-8. Eight eight. It's Well, 8-9, and 9-8. Yeah, but you know what I'm saying. They're, they're, they're middle of the road. They didn't do anything to get better. All right? They don't feel substantial. They don't feel consequentially better just because, I mean, the biggest move that they made was what, Flacco over Minshew? Yeah, for a backup. That's what for I'm a saying. Guy, for a guy who ideally never plays, but we all know is going to because the quarterback is going to get hurt. There's no question about it unless they change the way he plays. He has shown the way he plays, he's going to get hurt. And so I expect him to get hurt again. I hope he doesn't. He's an insane talent, and I'd like to see him play the position. But when I saw the way they used him last year, I said, this is this is never going to last. And it lasted, what, five games? Yeah, but how much of the how much of that is on him? Some of it. I mean, he's got to learn. Because he's got to figure out how to protect yeah, himself. Absolutely. You remember that exchange talk- with him and Trevor Lawrence at the first game of the season. Hey, yeah. learn how to slide, bud. I mean, we talked about that with Marcus. Yes. Marcus, Marcus was too competitive for his own good. And he put himself in harm's way, and he didn't have a body that could hold up to that. And Anthony Richardson doesn't have a body that can hold up to that. Now, Downs and Pittman, you know, they're a nice tandem of young receivers, but would you take them over Ridley and DeAndre? No. No. I mean, it's not it's not a thought, Buck. It's not a thought. No. No, you wouldn't. All right? Um, you, you like the Titans' backfield compared to their backfield. Their offensive line's better. There's, there's no doubt about it. Is their defense elite? No. No. Okay. So they're average. Yeah. Yeah. I expect the Titans to split with them this year. In a rebuilding year. Uh, at minimum. Because, the, I mean, that that's the thing that makes this all so fascinating is, Corey, the, the Titans are making moves like they're, like they're somebody. Well, they've got, look, they're making moves like they should. They've got a quarterback on a rookie deal. No, I agree. And they've, and they've, and but they, like Ridley and Snead are, are big boy moves. They are. And you know what they are? And, and, and that's what shocks me is that their Vegas number for wins hasn't gone up at all. Five and a half, I think, yeah, is the projected. I, it, look, that, like I said, Vegas is in the business of making money. I don't understand. I I don't. I don't. They've gone under their projected season win totals the last two seasons, and this is not the same team, obviously. They've no, made, not the same coaching staff. They've made very much sure of that. Now, they haven't done it three times in a row, and I got these stats from DraftKings since the 1990s prior yeah. to being the Tennessee Titans. So 
five and a half feels like easy money for this particular team. But, you know, the thing that determines all of it, that we really don't have much more of an answer than Indianapolis does with Anthony Richardson, is Will Levis. Yep. I feel I feel good about Will Levis. I feel confident that with the things that they have done, they are checking all the correct boxes for him to take a theoretical step here. I have no idea whether he's going to do it or not. And all the moves that they've made are completely and totally based upon whether they'll succeed or fail on his development. I think that's the big disconnect is there's a belief in Nashville about Will Levis. It's a huge disconnect between this place and everywhere else yes. in the league. And, and I really believe, look, we, we've been through this. There's, there's a lot of people who do not watch the Tennessee Titans. Okay, they, they don't. and I But I don't understand. It was Monday night football, man. And the kid was spectacular. And he he didn't sway anybody. I mean, was it, it was Des Bryant. Talking about Miami. Yeah. Des Bryant tweeted out that night, Will Levis is that dude. All right. So he swayed a few people. But, you know, the talking heads on ESPN and Fox I mean, uh, there, there was that jack wagon who said they're they're going to pick first next year. And you know right. what? May, may, maybe they do, and and he's right. But things have to come off the wheels for me to for that to happen. Um, but it, it, you know, they. I mean, these moves they're substantially better. I mean, they're secondary. Substantially, their their secondary is substantially better. All right, he's probably the most talented corner Sneed that they've had since I've been here. Since Samari, yeah. I mean, real, I mean, this is the best secondary since Samari Roll and Andre Dyson, with, without a doubt. What's your favorite acquisition that they've made? Because mine might be the center, Corey. I think that there well, are so yeah, many would, different things. I know that's not sexy, but I was just going to get to that. Just, oh, okay, go ahead. No, no, I mean, just, you know, because we were talking about substantially better. If you go Cushenberry, Skaronsky, Alt, you're already substantially better. One would hope. Up front. Substantially, and that's just half your line, all right? And then, you, you know, maybe you go Brunskill, and I don't know what you're going to do at right tackle. It's, you know, maybe that side of the line isn't better. All right? Maybe that side of the line stinks. Although Brunskill didn't have a terrible year. Okay? Mm. Okay. Look, our standards are different now. Mm. When you're comparing him to the tackles, Brunskill did not have a terrible year. Don't, don't make me say, I... <laughs> I'm not saying you can't upgrade, and you shouldn't. Okay. I just I don't want to have to. He he was very available. He's a very yes. tough player. Yep. They needed somebody like that yep. because he tried to take on as much of the Ben Jones kind of mm -hmm. mantra as humanly possible. He was always available for us to talk to. He's a very accountable person. I would like to see somebody better play right guard. I don't disagree with that. Okay. I'm just saying. I just don't want to. See, it sounds like a personal attack every nope. time I talk nope. about nope. Brunskill because nope. I'm just tired of watching no. all of the play. No, you look. You want to see better players at every position. Please. That's, that, that, I mean, that, that should always be your desire. I'm so tired, Corey. That should, but so, like, if, if you have half the line that is, you know, good, not just okay, but good, which I think if they get Alt at seven and they have Alt, Cushenberry, and Skaronsky, we expect that left side to be solid. I don't think, I, I don't think that that's just hoping. I mean, when you when you get the number one tackle in the draft, you have the number one offensive lineman from the previous draft, and then you have the top free agent center. I mean, you, I think you should have an expectation that that's going to be good. All right, I don't think there's 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 anything wrong with expecting. Your expectation is we can we can work with this, and the Titans had that before with the left side of the line when they had Luan and. Uh, and uh, Roger Saffold. and 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 Ben Jones, and then they just they kind of worked on the right side. They drafted Nate Davis, and they had Dennis Kelly, um, and and that line still kicked butt because you know what? If you will, if you only have to worry about half, then you've only got a scheme to help half. You can let the other half handle its business, and that's what that line did. Lawan Saffold Jones they handled their business. That was their best play during that run. Run left. Yeah. No, and, and absolutely. And so that's what I'm saying. If, if we can just get them back to that point, that's going to make them substantially better, all right? And they won seven and six games being awful. And so maybe I'm crazy. Maybe Mike Vrabel was great at coaching awful football teams. Maybe that was the magic elixir there. But I, I just have an, I have an expectation for this team to be more talented, all right, to score more points. And I feel like, that if the if the Dallas Cowboys, Pittsburgh Steelers, Green Bay Packers had had the offseason the Titans have had, 
that they would be the talk of the NFL right now. But because it's the Titans who are cheap and poorly run, that they still stink and that these moves don't matter. It's just like when they got DeAndre Hopkins last year. If he went to the Chiefs, oh, they're going to win the Super Bowl hands down. It's DeAndre Hopkins. The moment the Titans got him, he's washed up. And the moment the Titans sign Legereus Need, oh, well, then he's a huge problem. That's 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 bad. That's not a big deal. Like If somebody else gets Legereus Need, oh, my God, how are they going to lose a game now? They've got Legereus Need, the They'd number one. They have all of the training camp coverage. Uh, yes. NFL Network would have their live broadcast there every day, all of it. And so, look, I'm not, I'm not a fan. You know that. I'm just, this is what I see. No, you're a Bears fan. Worse. I'm a, ba- I'm a, yes, I'm a battered <laughs> Bears fan hoping they don't screw up Caleb Williams. All right. I, I, this is what I see. This is what I see. It's a huge disconnect. It's baffling. It's lazy. All right. That, that, I think that's what drives me crazy the most is it's lazy. All right. It, Nick Wright, if he's going to, and I know these talking heads say stuff to set people off and, and, and get their attention. And, and, and it works. And that's great. That's why I don't watch those shows because they're garbage to me. Because these guys say stuff that they don't mean 90% of the time just to get a rise out of people. That's how it works. But I would like for there to be some substance to your statement. Uh, why are they poorly run? Because they fired a coach who won 13 games in two years, but you liked him? No, but you can say on the way out the door as the commercial uh, break is coming up, yeah. oh, they'll pick first overall, and then everybody will get up yeah. in arms. And yeah. that's the that's the formula. And I yeah. quickly, Corey, because we have to take a quick break okay. here, uh, somebody has to run the football, and Landon and Ashley are hanging out in yep. studio with us My man. today, which we are very, very happy to see. Landon's favorite I player am. is Derrick Henry, and okay. he has some concerns, Landon Wright, about who's going to run the football next year for the Titans. Yeah? How do you feel about Tony Pollard replacing Derrick Henry? Because I know Derrick's your favorite. Play that so I can take his side in this play. Uh, what? <laughs> so, how do you feel about Derrick Henry in purple? That's, oh my gosh, that's not it's that's tough. not your favorite thing, is it? No. How much are you going to miss him? That much. A lot. What's your favorite color? Green. It's green. You know what? Just because he's your favorite player and he's not on your favorite team anymore, you can be happy for him. Um, I, so I went to Southern Illinois University. All right. Famously. Famously. We had two great basketball players last year, Marcus Domask and Lance Jones. They went to Illinois, Marcus did, and he just put up one of the like 10 triple doubles in NCAA tournament history and had an amazing year at Illinois and has now put himself in position to play professionally somewhere. To make you sad. And no, I'm going to get into that. And Lance Jones went to Purdue, hit a huge three against Tennessee. Makes me sad. And now he's going to the Final Four. So. Look, if SIU had both of those guys, we would have had a monster year. We would have been in the NCAA tournament. Instead, our coach got fired, and that's disappointing. Um, but I'm happy for those guys because they got put in position to have great years. Great years. They gave us three good years each. And just like a coach at SIU moves on to Illinois or Purdue, which happened, the players can move on too. They have that freedom, and they have that ability to improve their situation. They both did. And while I can be disappointed for SIU, I am very happy for those people. And so for Derrick Henry, disappointed that he left, disappointed the team didn't want him, but very happy that he's on a team that can play for the Super Bowl here towards the end of his career. He is the main man, Corey Curtis, WKRN News 2. You can watch him on Sports Extra on WKRN. Of course, you can follow him at Corey Curtis 2 on the socials. Buddy, thank you so much for the time. All right. Hey, Lan, it's great to see you. I followed you on Twitter through your whole journey, and it's awesome to see you in here with us. Absolutely. We're very happy to have Landon in studio with us. Landon's going to stick around because apparently his favorite song is Let's Talk About Sec. We'll do it next.
All right, welcome back to the show. Landon and Ashley have been kind enough to hang out in studio with us this hour, as well as Corey Curtis. We're very grateful for all of our friends hanging out with us today. Now, Landon's favorite player on the Titans has been Derrick Henry. He's also got a Jeff Simmons jersey. So I know he's going to be rocking that at Nissan Stadium. And Landon and Ashley are always so great to come up and see Blaine and Mickey and Kayla when she's there in the first hour at the pregame show. That's how... Landon and I and Ashley met other than knowing each other on social media. And obviously Landon's story has been something that every Titans fan seems to have been following along with. And, and everybody in Nashville who, who uh, really has uh, seen the way that our community has responded to some, somebody and, and a couple of people who've been going through it and overcome adversity and come out better for it on the other side. That's why Landon and Ashley are hanging out in studio with us today. It was cool to see you, by the way, on the, uh, on the Jumbotron. At the Preds game. They don't like when I go to Preds games, Landon, because when I go to Preds games, they lose. But this game, you were you were on the Jumbotron for that. Do you remember that? Yeah. I actually got to play hockey foosball. Oh, really? I There's actually two hockey foosball tables at the in in at the billion and at the in right next to the seat, Mom. And I actually hit the hockey puck into the both players' team swords. Oh, really? On, on hockey foosball, they actually scored to ten to ten. <laughs> so you you were scoring goals for both teams, huh? Yeah. So, Landon, you're gonna want to put your headphones on because you told us that you have a favorite song. And by the way, I actually, the hockey puck actually rolled on the fake ice when I played hockey foosball. Oh, really? And I actually. The hockey puck would be rolled right into the dough. <laughs> That's too funny. Wait, we'll uh, we'll work on your aim uh, next time. Maybe we'll get Bert to bring a uh, bring a foosball table in here. But now, now maybe the players' foosball table. No, we're gonna take the the players' foosball table out of the uh, out of the Titans' locker room. All right, you ready to hear your favorite song? You ready? All right, hit it. You gotta dance. So you move. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about the SEC. Let's talk about Nick Saban and Josh Heupel in the SEC. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about the SEC. Let's talk about Brian Kelly and Greg Sankey in the SEC. Let's talk about sex. How about that? You like that? I love that that's your favorite song. Landon, we are so grateful to have you guys in here with us today. Thanks for hanging out with us for the first hour, buddy. We really appreciate it. You're going to come back soon and see us, right? Absolutely. Because you said you said you wanted to get somebody fired today so you could take their job. Yeah, now he goes quiet on me. That's all right. Everybody's been trying to get me fired around here for years. So that I'm sure they'd be much happier. Join the cause. To see the toughest Titan, our guy Landon. He's got his shirt on in here. If you're watching on Zone TV, uh, fill in and be a future radio host probably sooner rather than later here on 104.5 The Zone. Buddy, thanks for hanging out. That's Landon and Ashley, kind enough to uh, spend a little time with us. Ashley, in fact, if you grab the mic uh, and let people know where, if if you guys are comfortable, where they can follow along with Landon's progress and all the great work that, that you guys have uh, done and, and seen the amount of support that's been sent your way. Yeah, I share his story on Instagram and Twitter, and I've been posting just updates about how he's been doing. Right. And and just so people uh, know who may be unfamiliar with, with uh, Landon's story, the Titans players have come to visit him as well in the hospital. What What is the condition called for people who may not be familiar? Yeah, so Landon is medically complex. He was born prematurely at 24 weeks. He weighed a pound and two ounces. And so he has um, just a lot of underlying medical conditions. And um, back in November, he contracted RSV um, and his body just was not able to fight it like it normally should. Um, and so that caused him to get really sick, um, and he was placed on a ventilator for over a month. And, buddy, you um, you could not be bigger and tougher and stronger today, right? I mean, I miss Titans games. You missed some Titans games, but that's okay because you're going to be at all the Titans games coming up this uh, this season, right? I miss the, the Titans game against the Bengals, and I miss the Titans game against the Bengals. 
Miami gets the Miami Dolphins. Well, that was a road game, but maybe <laughs> if if you do take my job, maybe you could start going on road trips too. Uh, you we go on road trips and just talk on the radio. Yes, I do go on road trips and talk on the radio. Some of the, some people would like to leave me in Miami so that I can't come back, but that way that you could get my job. No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take a quick break. Landon and Ashley have uh, been kind enough to hang out here with us. Uh, I'm Buck Rising, 104.5 The Zone.
It is 10.59. Good morning from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I'm Lucas Panzeca. The blockbuster trade of the day yesterday, the Houston Texans acquired former Bills receiver Stephon Diggs for draft compensation. The Bills receiving a 2025 second rounder via Minnesota. The Texans also receiving two late round picks for the 2024 draft. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers have agreed to terms with outside linebacker Randy Gregory on a one-year deal. Financial terms not dis- closed but Jeremy Fowler reporting that the deal is worth three million dollars with up to five million based on incentives the Nashville Predators in action tonight at Bridgestone before hitting the road to the northeast they host the St. Louis Blues puck drop is at seven for all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs visit USSTN.com breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols this is 104.5 The Zone How cool is that? I uh, Every time we're around somebody like Landon Lucas, I realize just how not tough and not capable of overcoming adversity you and I as human beings are. That dude is a fighter. Well, we already knew that, but you are correct. Sure. It's just a nice, it's a subtle reminder. No, you've accomplished absolutely nothing in your lives as opposed to Landon who has taken on the world and beat it uh, and continues to... Uh, overcome adversity on a regular basis so cool one of the strongest high fives i have ever experienced my guy my guy took a took, took a hammer to me uh, as far as the uh, the high fives go he's gonna make one hell of a running back uh he said he's gonna hit he hit me as hard as he's going to hit the cardinals players <laughs> when he's a running back for the titans <laughs> not a cardinals ref- fan landed no and he refused to give robert a hug i assume it's because robert's rat birds took derrick henry away from him he didn't give you a hug i thought it here. was the odor but maybe <laughs> that's what it is oh now you can make jokes about him smelling bad but when i do it it's too far <laughs> 615-737-1045 is the number. Uh, again, thanks to Landon and Ashley for spending some time with us. We pivot seamlessly back to Titans and draft conversation. We really haven't talked that much draft this year, have we? It feels like we've, uh, and I know you and I have no great love for mock draft lists and things of that nature, but there's been so much news in this pre-draft cycle, be it trades, be it free agency, hirings firings everything in between and then when you know when we haven't had titan stuff the university of tennessee is toppling the ncaa as an institution and that's taken up a bit of our pre-draft coverage but i suppose with 21 days three weeks left to go we should probably three weeks to the date of the nfl draft we should probably talk a little draft at some point huh we shall we know what the highest priority in the draft is we know that it's tackle Left tackle, probably a right tackle. You could use some interior offensive line help. You've got the core of your team built out in free agency, but now it's time to add the pieces that are going to keep this thing cost-effective moving forward into the future and ensure, if you do it right, that you don't have to pay other people's best players top of market. You can pay to keep your own guys. Wouldn't that be a novel concept? You haven't done any of that in quite some time. Tried to. With who? With Aziz and Danico. Oh, sure. But I'm talking about dudes that you drafted. Guys yeah. who, uh, guys who, uh, Taylor Lewan, Jeff Simmons, Harold Landry. Who's the last second contract of a Titans draft pick? A uh, Jeff. Well, Harold. No. Jeff. Jeff was after Harold. Yeah, Jeff. Um, yeah, but Jeff is the only first rounder that got a second contract from the Titans under John Robinson? Since Lawan. Well, Lawan wasn't a Robinson draft right, pick. Right, but, but Robinson got him the deal. But yes. Sure. Yes. But John Robinson did not get a uh, first-round draft pick. Yeah, Jeff's the first one since since Taylor. Which is crazy. That's Taylor was drafted in 2014. And then in 2023, they give Jeff Simmons a contract extension. 
Now, that's just first-round picks, but still, that's that's the kind of drought that we're talking about. And I think for for Titans fans, this is now going on five straight off-seasons of us talking about tackles. I mean, I've only had the radio show. We've only had the radio show, Lucas. This is We've just eclipsed three years in March, and we've spent every damn off-season that we've been on the air as a radio show talking about them needing tackle help. So we know what the top priority is. It's the same top priority that you've had since damn Jack Conklin walked. What is your lowest priority position in the draft this year? Let's take the specialists off the table. I'm not talking about drafting punters or kickers, but now that you have seen free agency or at least the first big wave of free agency take place, what are you looking around and saying, all right, only have seven draft picks, not going to be able to do it all this offseason. What's a position that we can let linger a little longer? I'm okay with not drafting a corner. I see the argument for a late round pick at cornerback, but I think you're so set there in terms of your starting three that that is one position that moves at or near the bottom of the list for me. AJ Parkinson in the FNM Bank chat. By the way, you can call the show, 615-737-1045. You can interact via Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch if you would like to. Uh, AJ Parkinson says, can you please, can you guys please stop talking about our embarrassing mismanagements Rename the show Buck Rising Talks Tackles. I don't want to do that. I'm so tired of talking about offensive linemen. I just wish they'd get them and let them stay there for 10 years and never have to talk about the offensive line again. Derek on the FNM Bank chat says tight end is low on his priority list. No, they need another tight end. But if it's not Brock Bowers, they need another tight end. I feel like we're going to say that, though about a lot of different positions, and they're not going to... Yeah, they need another tight end. They need cornerback depth. They need depth on the interior of the offensive line. They need a, t- like they need a lot of things, Buck. They're not it's gonna about replace what's Ch- lowest on the list. They're not going to bump Chig down a peg in free agency. We understand that. So, to your point, is it Brock Bowers or a tight end? You could always use a Brock Bowers. Do you necessarily 100% need a tight end that's not Brock Bowers in this draft? The answer is no. You can find another guy after the draft in post-draft free agency, because of course that exists, to come in here and be your third guy, your H back, whatever they envision. Because again, I don't know how I don't know how much three how many three tight end sets they're gonna run. I know they're gonna add a tight end, but the Bengals didn't have a fullback on the roster at any point with Brian Callahan as the offensive coordinator there. So are we looking at Chig as that move piece? Is he both your inline tight end? Is he your tight end one? I don't have a definitive answer on Chig yet that way. If that's the way that the draft order falls. I, he's again, we've talked about this. I don't I'd be curious to see just where he ends up at all. Like how many teams are good enough at tight end that they're willing to let that dude slide? Because I think he could be the Will Levis this year. Where people, not that he could slide out of the first round. Brock Bauer is going to be a first round pick, but I think he's the guy that the draft room cameras are going to be focused on if he's in attendance because that guy ends up falling a little further than we might have expected. I just think at some point he's going to be he's going to be best available too early. I agree for me to see him like slide significantly in a way that Will Levis did. But he's a you know he's the arguably the third best player or a top three overall talent. In this draft class, a slide would be out of the top 10. You know what I'm saying? Or, I mean, hell, a slide would be out of the top five. Yeah, if you're getting Brock Bowers at, like, 16. That's a slide. Then you're getting one hell of a bargain. Right, it's like Jeff at 19 a couple of years ago without the ACL tear. I think I'm going to say safety because I think that I'm, you know, I know there's only three weeks left, but three weeks is a long enough time to be able to bring in veteran safety help. I think a vet safety with an Elijah Molden makes me feel a lot better about the safety situation. Justin Simmons is still out there. They've shown interest. Marcus May is still out there. They've shown interest. So I'm probably going to stay in the secondary where you're saying you're good without with them not drafting a corner. They don't absolutely need to draft a corner now in the same way that they don't absolutely need to draft a wide receiver now, though they do still need to draft a wide receiver. I'm more looking at corner in the same way that I'm looking at wide receiver as opposed to 
the way that I'm looking at the safety spot. Wide receiver for me just got pushed down with the Calvin Ridley signing. It was it was second round latest for me before the Ridley signing. Now it's okay, day three, there will be some value there. Cornerback similar since the Legarius Need edition, especially with not having a third round pick. Like the lack of a third round pick is the biggest factor in these conversations because your only day two pick at the moment is at 38, near the top of the second round. Are you still tackle at seven yes. or, or bust? Yeah, tackle you, at seven. You don't, you don't, you're not interested in them trading back for exactly that reason that you just articulated. They don't have a third round pick and their needs are glaring everywhere. Tackle in the first round. I am tackle in the first oh, round no, or yeah. bust. Oh, we're, we're, I, I think, well, I don't want to say that I'm completely in agreement with you. I just don't know how this staff is evaluating guys and how whatever tackle they like would fit into an offense that we haven't seen yet under Brian Callahan with Bill as the offensive line coach. It, it's all up to their evaluation. I have no idea what their evaluation of Joe Alt is versus Fashanu or Fuaga or Mims if they think he could play. I have no idea, but tackle in the first round or bust for me because, again, I feel like I've repeated it a million times. Nobody, not one soul, has proposed a solution at left tackle beyond taking one in the first round. That makes me feel even remotely good about that spot. Yeah, I think most people are in agreement with you. Whereas you can do that at wide receiver. Mm -hmm. You can give solutions after the first round. You now have the buffer built in well enough with Calvin Ridley that wide receiver is no longer as pressing an issue because I did, pre-Ridley, I did believe it to be as pressing an issue as the tackle situation was. I, I I still disagree with that because even pre-Ridley, you could have convinced me that, oh, I can show you a solution at 38 for receiver to play opposite DeAndre Hopkins. Maybe not a special elite top 10 talent, but I can show you that solution. Tackle more pressing because you have no options right no, now. I, None. I needed I needed a legit proven commodity um, at the position, and I don't know that I was going to, I don't know that I was going to be satisfied with a wide receiver situation at 38 if they could take one of the best ones at seven. 615-737-1045 is the number. Uh, a couple of people submitting their suggestions in the FNM Bank chat. The In order, or maybe not in order, but safety, running back, cornerback are probably positions to not draft or that you could afford not to draft. Not that you don't need to draft a safety or don't need to draft a corner, but I'm probably in agreement with that. I would say running back is probably the lowest priority on the list. You have Spears. You have Pollard. Julius Chestnut was resigned. Hassan Haskins, I don't know. Can he do anything on special teams? Is he he's, is he a returner at all? He doesn't, he doesn't quite have that kind of burst that I feel like Spears displayed when he was back there returning kicks for the Titans last year. I would like to see somebody take that returning responsibility off Tajay Spears' plate if you can help it. But running back is probably the lowest priority of any position that you have. Safety then, and, and you know, you could debate corner. Or, I mean, that's basically it. Everything else you absolutely have to have this year. Maybe tight end. Coming up next, there is a... Super League proposal in the world of college football. Not only are you getting a 12-team playoff this year, not only has a 14-team playoff been agreed upon, but now the idea of a Super League is out there. It's looming over everything, and we'll talk about it coming up next.
We went one whole day with good music, and then you immediately defaulted back to the same Justin Timberlake instrumental that I've heard 9,000 times in my life. Damn, you're not a Justin Timberlake guy. I'm not a Justin Timberlake fan after what you've done to me. <laughs> this is, this it's a shame. Is dragging it. I mean, I, and it's crazy, too. I was going to surprise you with this, but he, uh, he was going to join the show next week. Not anymore. I don't want to. What do I want to talk to Justin Timberlake about? Not anymore. What do you you want to talk to Justin Timberlake? What would you possibly have to say about <laughs> Justin Timberlake? Are you going to ask him about his ownership percentage in the Grizzlies? Hey, he's a big Memphis guy. No, for sure. I mean, I, what, what's the music festival he puts on? Does he the the one on Beale Street? Does he do that? No, no, no. Uh, isn't there was one in Franklin that I think he's a part of? Yeah. Oh, pilgrimage. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. He is involved in that. I think. Yeah. We. We. That's what we were going to talk about. Uh. Well. Uh, I'm sorry. So um, now now just me saying that, he's already heard that. His representation is already yeah, canceled. I guess I'll cancel. Okay. Well, what? I uh, I don't know. I'd probably ask him more questions about his relationship with Britney Spears than, <laughs> than I would Pilgrimage Fest, but either way. So we will uh, we will save the Justin Timberlake interview for a later podcast. 615-737-1045 is the number. Super Leagues. How do we feel about the term super leagues around our sports we went through this what about a year ago year and a half ago with international soccer was it specifically premier league that was talking about a super league it was teams from the premier league from la liga in spain from Serie A in italy the biggest clubs in europe coming together and saying hey why are we letting all these other clubs drag us down let's just put it all together and basically let those clubs die out and just be the Super League that everybody's going to watch anyway. And the outcry was overwhelming. Yeah. Now, international soccer fans stopped this from happening. And it's funny because if I remember correctly on the reporting around this stuff, Lucas, the people or the ownership groups that were pushing for Super League in international soccer were primarily American. A lot of Americans involved. A lot of American ownership groups. Not only. I mean, Fiorentino Perez of Real Madrid was kind of spearheading the thing. Sure. Spanish owner. But yes, primary, a lot of Americans were involved. So, now it sounds like, in a different kind of situation, we may see this in college football. Andrew Marchand and Stuart Mandel of The Athletic put together a report yesterday, came out yesterday afternoon, several college presidents are proposing to dramatically alter the way that college football is organized. There's a group called College Sports Tomorrow that they have now formed, and they've floated the idea of creating a two-tiered structure among FBS schools, quote, the current College Sports Tomorrow outline, would create a system that would have the top 70 programs, all members of the five former major conferences, so Power Five, plus Notre Dame and the new ACC member SMU, as permanent members and encompass all 130-plus FBS universities. The perpetual members would be in seven 10-team divisions, joined by an eighth division of teams that would be promoted from the second tier. We've talked to Pate about this kind of stuff before. And he's brought up, and Chris Childers and our other friends who are way more connected to the world of college athletics and college football specifically than Lucas or I, they've been talking about it trending towards Super League stuff for years. Really, since we've started had Pate started having Pate and and Chris and other people like that on the show, they've been talking about the idea of Super Leagues. But in the context of what the Big Ten and SEC are doing. Which is what they have increasingly been concentrated on, those two conferences, because they're the biggest power brokers of anybody. Conference realignment has given them that opportunity as if they weren't already that, but adding, you know, basically absorbing all of the Pac-12 into the Big Ten and the SEC adding... Texas and Oklahoma for their own version of a Super League. They've got the biggest stick at the party, basically. So 
looking at this, it makes sense for football teams, but football, football and basketball teams almost exclusively. Because they are the they are the programs that have the resources to travel cross country for this. They are the they are the revenue generators. We'll see what happens with women's college basketball, given the television numbers, the interest. We'll see if they can maintain. It's all about star power, as pro football or pro sports has taught us. Time in and time out, LeBron can single handed handedly change the NBA's ratings structure because he moves from Eastern. Uh, Eastern time to Pacific time, going from the Cavs to the Lakers, and you've seen the league continually trying to clean up that mess. Have you seen the price differences, the average Final Four ticket for the men's Final Four versus the women's? It's almost double. It is. And this was as of a couple days ago, but the minimum ticket price on StubHub, John Fanto is putting this out there, for the men's side was $571. The minimum ticket price on StubHub to get into the women's final four, 970. Now, the thing about this, just to kind of get back into the Super Leagues discussion, Lonzo Wright, and you can uh, call in if you want to react to this or, or you can interact on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. Lonzo on YouTube says, why do people have to ruin college sports? College sports ruined college sports. Athletic directors, school presidents, television uh, executives. Those are the people that had the structure initially in place that was deemed unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of the United States. College sports, in its initial inception, in the guise, the, I mean, it's a, it's a foolish term, student athlete. The way that they've tried to use it basically as a yoke on these kids who haven't been getting paid throughout the entirety of college athletics history where they should have been able to capitalize when it, when it becomes a multi, not million, but a multi-billion dollar industry and you're still outsourcing pay to the local Ford dealership or your favorite iced tea brand or something like that. College sports in its inception, in the greed of its inception laid the foundation for all of this to come crumbling down at a later point. The fact that they had as long a run as they did without somebody telling them how unconstitutional what it was that they were doing allowed them to make so much money across those kind of power brokers that have control over this thing. So don't blame people ruining college sports. It was broken from the start, and now they're trying to put it back together in the best possible way, though that process is going to be rocky. It's going to be unpleasant. It's going to change a lot of your norms. Don't look. Don't be so foolish as to look at this like college, college athletics and the way that it was designed for student-athletes wasn't broken from the jump. Well, that's the laziest thing people are going to do. They're going to see this group that comes together, college sports tomorrow, comprised of you know various different business figures in the sports world, the Sixers owner, the NFL's deputy commissioner, 20 people in this oh, group. Oh, you know the league is involved in this. Are you kidding me? More money. But more money. People are going to look at this and say, oh, they're coming in to ruin college football when they're actually coming in to try and save it. Exactly. And it's about figuring out how to do so because now we're at a point where, like, yeah, you're right. It is broken. It is beyond broken. We need to save it and the only answer people want to hear is going back to what it was, which is not going to happen. The toothpaste out of the tube. It's about saving it and trying to figure out the best way to do that. And at least this is an idea towards that. Now, I don't think it'll ever happen. But I like that we're at least talking about these things and not just sinking deeper into whatever the hell it is that we are currently doing in college athletics. Pate, uh... I was listening to Pate's podcast, Late Kick uh, Live. Uh, you can check it out on his YouTube channel and stuff like that. We'll have to have him in soon. I know he's currently, uh, he just visited with uh, Kalen DeBoer at Alabama. They had a, a, I think about an hour-long conversation about the state of that program, and he's touring a variety of different campuses around the country right now. But Pate brought this up the other day while I was listening to him. To your point about people coming in trying to save this thing who have kind of been on the sidelines of the discussion for a while. The, the smartest minds, you've, you've let the people who are incapable of putting this thing together, i.e. the NCAA, muck it up for long enough over a course of, what has it been, two years since uh, the Supreme Court ruling? 
More than two years. It feels like more. Well, it feels like an eternity, but that's because every every time I look up, college athletics is changing. Since the Supreme Court ruling, the NCAA has allowed this, in their own terminology, to be the wild, wild west, and then, even further, to not have the proper protections in place nationwide to make sure that they could uphold any kind of semblance of rule or law according to their guidelines, to allow the university, well, not the university, the states of Tennessee and the Commonwealth of Virginia to basically take a hatchet to what NIL legislation or the NCAA's guidelines over NIL legislation are right now. The people who have been sitting out these things or have been kind of on the sidelines and seeing how quickly it devolves, to Pate's point, are now coming in to try and rescue the thing. Now, in a perfect world, you would like these things to be pro- proactive as opposed to reactive because it now feels like we are seeing far more reaction from people that matter, Greg Sankey, uh, the Big Ten, college football, t- college sports tomorrow, all these different things who are trying to stave off even more madness that's already kind of got college football in a, or college sports in a vice grip. I'm sorry, I keep diverting to college football but that is of course the biggest power broker in all of this so while you may not see those changes immediately just as it took time for us to devolve for college athletics to devolve to this point it's going to take time to get the thing right but the fact that they're you know after two and a half years taking legitimate action to try and shepherd this thing into the future in the best way possible it's not going to look the same but it shouldn't and and i you know I understand. I I don't want to be cold with college sports fans because I am my favorite. My favorite sports team is a college basketball team. The only team that I care about in my life as a fan is a college basketball team. All right. I I love the tradition of college sports. I love how much more people care about their alma maters rooting for their their colors, their logos, whatever the case may be, than they are at the pro level. Because it just it just hits different. I, I don't know how else to describe it, but I know you guys know exactly what I'm talking about, and it's passed down generationally. Some of you guys have had Tennessee volunteer tickets or Vanderbilt basketball tickets or whatever the case may be, passed down through your family. You have a, a, a fond recollection of growing up, going to games with your parents, your grandparents, your family, whatever the case may be, and that stuff sticks with you, and you carry that tradition on. Tradition is the difference between college college athletics and the pros even though you know there's franchises like the packers that have 100 years 100 year old histories or things like that it's just different in college sports i'm not advocating against that but i don't know how else how to put it more gently for you other than a lot of that stuff is going to change and it will ultimately be for the betterment of the health of the sport in an environment that is absolutely changing for the good because you've gotten away with not paying college athletes for way too long. And at some point, it has to balance out. People hate change. People hate change. They can't mangle the thing so badly, though, that nobody wants to watch it anymore because it's still the thing that the thing that people accuse of mutating college athletics the most, the money and the greed, is the exact same thing that's going to keep it viable because they want to continue to make money off this thing. They don't want to turn you off. They don't want to run their audiences away. They have to figure out how to keep their base while still growing the sport in a way that continues to earn revenue for the television networks. I actually like this setup. I like this outline, a system with the top 70 programs, which basically is the every, every program in the five power conferences, plus Notre Dame and SMU is now in the ACC. <laughs> and... Seven 10-team divisions joined by an eighth division of teams that would be promoted from the second tier. So like a promotion relegation system like in European soccer. And basically the winner of every division and eight wild cards from that top tier go to the postseason. No committee to decide who gets to go. The argument then, the debate would become how we divvy up the divisions and how many rivalries would get sacrificed and all these things, how how regional and and geographic it would be. But in theory, there is a world where I love the way that this looks, that this is the closest thing that we have to getting back to some semblance of college football being geographic 
which I think is the root of why people love college football. This is our thing in the Southeast, right? And the ACC, this is like, what, what is, is Cal? Cal's not a part of this, of what we're doing over here with Florida State and Clemson and Miami. So if we could bring back a semblance of that with 10, 17 divisions and no discussion about who makes the playoff based on what a committee thinks, I kind of love that. I don't think it'll ever happen because the powers that be, most notably in the SEC and Big Ten, I don't think would allow it to happen because it would just continue to pull power away from them and the stakes that they have with automatic bids and those type of things. They want more control over the destinies of their teams, not something that would spread things out more. Understandable, as is their job. As is their job. Now, the but thing, in theory, I kind of kind of love it. Well, but the thing that I don't have the answers to, based on the article, and again, the athletic dot com is where the reporting was done. Andrew Marchand, who's their media writer, and then Stuart Mandel, who's one of their top college football people, had the article out there about college football's ex- or college athletics exploratory committee to form super leagues. But the thing that I don't have an answer to. And ultimately, we're going to find out how much people care about saving these sports. Timothy Howe says this on YouTube. As a dad to a young daughter, I worry about smaller girls' programs. I hope she can play volleyball or swim or do whatever she loves, but the NCAA is a mess. What the hell happens to Title IX is my question with all of this. Because we understand there are far more non-revenue sports than there are revenue-generating sports. How, How are they going to... What is their plan to essentially have football, basketball, in some places baseball, but not really that many? How are they going to have football and basketball subsidize all of this stuff? Are they, are they prepared for that level of accounting? Are they just going to completely disregard Title IX? Because it's already kind of, I don't want to say it's already kind of a, uh, they've made a mockery of it. What it's supposed to be is not actually being upheld. And you can argue right, wrong, and different, but by the letter of the law, they have not done Title IX justice. This new situation is going to continue to devolve that, one would think, unless they have proper protections built in. So if you are a parent of a daughter and you have those concerns about wanting them to pay or play varsity sports, scholarship caliber sports, things that are going to alleviate the burden of what it might cost to send your kid to college, these are legitimate concerns. 615-737-1045 615-737-1045 is the number somebody in the uh, in the comment section said, tax the football and basketball players. Yeah, I'm sure they'd love that. Hey, well, first pay them the television money. Once you're paying them the television money, then I'm comfortable with you taxing the college basketball and football players. Whatever gets us to a CBA. Whatever makes them employees. They need, they need to be employees of the university. They need to have protections in the same way that we're talking about protections for Title IX built in. These, these men and women who are committing to basically a full-time job while trying to get a college education, they need to be employees of the university. Tennessee has already taken steps to explore that, to try and put some kind of system in place to normalize this. That's part of the Super League uh, proposition. They're going to have to form unions because they need to be they need to be compensated properly for the empire that's built then built upon their unpaid backs. I can't believe you're going to have me talk about Rand Carthon and kickoff rule next. Really? That's <laughs> That's how you want me to pivot? This has been a very it's been a very spirited conversation and I don't know. I don't know. But what do you want to accomplish with Rand Carthon and kickoff rules? Find out next. <laughs>
big Gwen Stefani guy, huh? I'm going to bring this up every time. I don't, I don't know what you expect from me at this point. I wow, just, not a Gwen Stefani guy, Buck Rising. No, I am a Hollaback girl. But I just don't understand why we can't come up with a theme every day consistently for music so we're not just defaulting to 3HL's library, which is all over the place and must encompass the entire system of what's back there. Uh, Robert Walsh, what do you think about Buck Rising not being a Gwen Stefani guy? You're not liking Gwen Stefani. What is he going to say next? He doesn't like Scott. You're not a big uh, one direct, no direct. What kind of what band was she in? You're not in a Direction fan? Come on. What are you doing? I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Why is he on the phone? We're just chatting. Don't worry about it. <laughs> just checking how his day's going. I just, I just want you to. I don't know what I can do to break this up. I've already tried. I've already sent him away to the morning show. All right. I don't know what else that I can do to get him out of my life. But I just, I don't know if it's more of a. I don't know if it's more of a, if it would be less of a headache to send you to the morning show. Should we just do a pick swap? Should we send you to the morning show so you have to wake up at 4.30 and then I'll take Burt back just to move on with this? I need, I need time in the mornings. I am not capable of like just waking up you and gotta go. You need time in the morning. <laughs> I need, I need like a 90 minute buffer between when I wake up and I have to like go out the door and, and have my day started. I like to take my time, drink my coffee, watch a little you know, get up on ESPN, whatever it might be, just kind of get in the right, eat a good breakfast. I am not capable of rolling out of bed at 5.30 to go do a 6 a.m. radio show. Yeah, 5.30. You got to be here at 5.30. Yeah, right. Like, you would be here at 5.30 if you host <laughs> I, the morning show. I, you honestly have a better chance of show of me showing up an hour before the morning show. Get him off the phone, Lucas. Stop talking to Robert on the phone while we're doing the radio show. Stop it. We're having a good chat. I don't care. Why you had to interrupt it. What do you want to talk about, talk about with Rand and the new kickoff rule? Well, he was asked about it and how that could impact roster decisions because it does impact roster decisions. The way you have to line up with the new kickoff. The Chiefs went out and signed a rugby player because of the new kickoff rule. So Titans GM Rand Carthon asked about it with the media the other day. Well, it's, this league is all about the more you can do. Um, and, you know, taking those, it's only, you only get 53 roster spots and you get the two elevations. So whoever we decide to be our returner, hopefully they can bring more than just returning unless they're just flat out dynamic. If they're Devin Hester or Dante Hall or one of those guys, we'll gladly take them. Um, but we love for them, you know, to do a little bit more. And I think with the uh, new change of the kickoff rule, it's going to be an adjustment period for everybody um, because, again, we got to figure out how this thing is going to be policed you know, throughout the league, it's it's a in, in my opinion, it's different from saying we're going to be an emphasis on the hip drop tackle or you know holding or you know illegal contact. Those are things that have uh, traditionally been policed in this league, but we're changing the structural way in which you do a play that we've never had before in our league. So the preseason is going to be very important for us more than anything to figure out how we're going to be able to execute you know that play for us to start the game because it's really going to be the first offensive snap. I like that perspective. I'm glad you played it. Did you know that the UFL is going back to the traditional kickoff rules now that the NFL what? has adopted? Yeah, because I was swapping. That's what I'm saying. Like, because <laughs> I had initially said, "Oh, well, you, if you want to go, if you want to go see what it's going to look like, you can check out the UFL." Only to find out that the UFL, by the way, which is the USFL and the XFL, for those of you who are unfamiliar, that have joined forces to bring us one spring football league. The UFL now has gone back to the traditional kickoff rules. So I'm very confused by their logic. Interesting. But, but either way. So this was a, a proposal made by special teams coordinators. I'm in favor of it because the kickoff has become a wasted play. I feel like the vast majority of people are in favor of it because the kickoff had become a wasted play. It's just something that you use for your bathroom breaks or to go up and get another beer from the fridge or whatever the case may be. Uh, at a football game. It doesn't mean anything now. The low, low, low percentage of something exciting actually happening is not worth the risk of the injury rates on the original kickoff. So, uh, with that being said, the new kickoff rule, just to kind of reiterate, and this is by the league's definition, um, this was passed for what? Now, this is interesting. It, do you find it interesting that they only passed it for one-year changes? That this is not something that's permanent. It's just something that they're passing as a one-year 
sample size because in theory you would want for the sample size to be what the ufl was doing and then to adopt it and say all right we're moving forward this way and not just a one-year thing no i'm i'm fine with it i don't think there's any harm in doing it this season and, and see how it plays out if it does check the boxes that you're looking for it to check i mean isn't that the case as well that wasn't that the case with the pass interference that you could challenge pass interference was a one-year thing and yeah. it never got reversed disaster so they went back so, what you are going to get with this new look kickoff or this altered kickoff situation is a, a, some semblance of a return game. Now, you're hearing that from Rand Carthon. You'd like a player that has versatility that can contribute more than just a dynamic returner. Uh, you want, you know, a wide receiver, a, a defensive back, a, a running back who's going to be able to do both of these jobs, either in a depth role or as a starter. I'm assuming that Tajay Spears is the kickoff returner going into 2024, right? Why not Pollard? Well, I don't know. You pro I mean, I my my position would be well, you just delegate it to the younger guy. Which I mean, is which is what Pollard he that's what he was when he was returning kicks for the Cowboys. You know, I mean, Zeke's not going to do it, but. It's one of the most significant changes to gameplay that we've had because it's altering how you're going to have to coach this thing, which I, I like. And I, it sounds like coaches are down for it, too. That It's just, you know, you're refreshing something. It gives you the opportunity to continue to tinker with things. It raises the stakes for special teams coaches, certainly, to see how well you're going to be able to execute this stuff. And players, players that now maybe have more of a route to stay on a 53-man roster, though it is going to be a bit jarring for X veteran special teams linebacker, a Luke Gifford, for example, that has been excelling in special teams his entire life a certain way. And then the first day of training camp, it's like, all right, boys, here's how we're going to do this. It's going to be a very strange uh, beginning to this, I bet, for the players that have made their careers in special teams that now have to basically relearn one of the key components of their football jobs. Well, especially because I mean, how often does does a kickoff a turn? Or, 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 excuse me, does a kickoff occur in an NFL game? On average, it's about ten times. So this, these are ten plays, ten meaningful plays that you can have take place and impact your ability to compete. If you've got, you know, some kind of, we'll see what how how much better the Chiefs are with the addition of this rugby player and how much that kind of sets a trend for the rest of the league but they had to make the alterations to the initial kickoff to help with the injuries and what it turned the existing kickoff play into was a non-factor now they are actually going to factor into football games and you heard Rand Carthon articulate exactly how they're going to go about evaluating it during the preseason seeing how it's officiated and then make a determination on who can help them best just as all 31 other clubs will have to do. All right. There's been some news in Kansas City about the city not subsidizing professional sports. And I'm curious to know how Titans fans feel about this. We're going to give you some information on what happened with the Kansas City Chiefs and the Royals and what relevance it has to the Titans Stadium project coming up next.
below MSRP, below MSRP, below MSRP. It's pretty simple. Two Rivers Ford sells all new non-specialty Fords below MSRP. Mortgage professionals in Middle Tennessee. Hi, I'm Chuck McDowell, owner of Wesley Mortgage. I'm a true local, born in Mount Julia, met my wife at MTSU, and I live in Franklin. While every other mortgage company is cutting back, we're rapidly expanding and investing. Are you sick of feeling like an operations employee to ensure your loans are closed on time? When you look around your office, it doesn't look the same. You're missing people. You're missing your friends. Is anyone having fun? We're having fun every day. As the official mortgage provider of the Tennessee Titans, I've personally recruited the top local operations team to ensure your loans are closed on time. So you get paid. So you get to spend time building your business and you get to have fun at work again. Now is the time to join our team, to start a confidential conversation with our local president and COO. Visit whywesley.com, whywesley.com. The guaranteed offer is the easiest way to sell your home. It's really simple. We bring you an all-cash offer, you close in as little as 21 days, no home inspections, no lockboxes, no open houses. Go to MarkSpain.com to get a guaranteed offer and start packing. It is 12 o'clock. Good afternoon. I'm Lucas Panzeca from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. In NFL news, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have agreed to terms with veteran outside linebacker Randy Gregory on a one-year deal. It is reportedly for $3 million with up to $5 million based on incentives. Women's basketball, Iowa star Caitlin Clark is the AP Player of the Year in women's hoops for the second straight year. The women's Final Four begins tomorrow in Cleveland with UConn taken on Iowa. And tonight, the Nashville Predators trying to snap a three-game losing skid. They host the St. Louis Blues. Puck drop is at 7 p.m. at Bridgestone Arena. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone.
We are already in the final hour of the radio show. It is moving fast, as is always the case. We love hanging out with you guys. Thanks for being here. So the Titans are getting a new stadium. Have you been by Nissan recently? I walked by uh, the footprint of Nissan Stadium prior to the SEC tournament because that's where they were having us park. And then I just, you know, happened to be a nice morning. I walked across the pedestrian bridge, saw all the construction that's starting around Nissan. Not full bore just yet, but noticeably different, noticeably tore up. (laughs) Have you been over there? So the ground has been very broken, right? Is that basically the way to put it? We had a yeah, groundbreaking that, ceremony a few weeks ago. The ground is officially broken. They did slightly more damage than Amy Adams Strunk did with her golden Titans logo shovel. <laughs> You're telling me she hasn't been out there every day, just still still digging? Uh, I, you know, I don't know. She, she she may have somebody in her family who uh, is interested in uh, treasure hunting. You go out there with a metal detector or something like that. God knows what's buried under Nissan Stadium. Maybe a saber tooth tiger. Well, yeah, that's, that is a possibility. And certainly you hope that the Preds show a little more teeth tonight that's a mickey ryan type of joke well done so Titans are getting a new stadium uh the state of tennessee issued 452.7 million dollars in bonds over 20 years expecting to pay 230.2 million in interest uh the bond issuances were the final step in a deal to build a new nfl stadium for the titans which state lawmakers approved back in 2022 and the metro metro nashville council cleared what last april almost a year ago so that's moving forward with the titans taxpayer money is involved that is not a surprise to anybody publicly it seems like the new mayor freddie o'connell has not been I mean, it doesn't seem like he's been a proponent at all of the new Titan Stadium. And that was a big part of, you remember having, well, you weren't here the day that Mayor John Cooper came in studio with me. Should we have the mayor on? We we haven't asked. We should probably ask. That doesn't seem like a terrible idea. I'll We'll reset, reach out to the necessary parties because I'd just be curious to know his position on a variety of different things, sports adjacent. But Nashville's in for the new stadium. That's happening. Have you paid attention at all, and this is probably not a question for Lucas because it's news-related, and I know the world just happens around Lucas on a perpetual basis. Have you paid attention at all what's happening with the Kansas City Chiefs and the Royals and Jackson County, Missouri, who resoundingly voted down a sales tax measure that would have helped fund a new downtown ballpark along with major renovations to Arrowhead? Have you paid any attention to this at all? I have not. Does it surprise you to know that the fine residents of Jackson County, Missouri, have resoundingly voted against a new baseball stadium and significant improvements to Arrowhead because all the Chiefs do is win Super Bowls, and I've been paying attention to the Royals. I'm not going to act like I know what's going on in MLB, other than I think the Marlins are like 0-7, a terrible start of the year. Um. Are you surprised to hear that publicly it got shot down that hard? Because they were out here campaigning for it very, very vigorously. They had Mahomes and Andy Reid doing commercials. They had players for the Royals getting up and doing PSAs and stuff like that. I'm not surprised because I just put myself in the shoes of a Chiefs fan. And if I was a Chiefs fan, I would say, don't touch Arrowhead. Leave it alone. We have one of the most historic Best environments in the NFL. Even for renovations. Do not touch Arrowhead Stadium. That's what I'd be saying. Well, but we're not talking about renovations, are we? Yes, we are talking about renovations. We're not talking talking about... about, No, we're talking... So, this is a Royals and Chiefs joint thing. The new stadium is the baseball stadium. What they're proposing that would be taxpayer-funded for the Chiefs is a renovated Arrowhead. Not a new Arrowhead, but a renovated Arrowhead. Okay. So, like, Lambeau went through this a couple of years ago. You were you were recently at Lambeau. Did it feel like it had lost any of its no. mystique? No, not at all. Because of the, But Lambeau went through a significant amount of renovation to get it to that point. Fair. Um, apparently, the Royals pledged at least $1 billion from ownership for their project, which is a $2 billion-plus ballpark and a district that's associated. Everybody wants the battery now that the Braves have done it so well. 
the Chiefs committed $300, $300 million in private money, which is pennies, and would have used their share as part of an $800 million overhaul of Arrowhead Stadium. So basically, they were asking the customers to foot the majority of the bill, and hey, we'll chip in an extra 300 mil. But 500 of that is what it's going to take from public money to get a renovation or renovation at Arrowhead done. I saw this quote, and I just I'm just curious to know how it bounces off Titans fans because I don't think this that all that this situation is applicable to every every owner in sports. But I did think it was an interesting sentiment. Um, Albert Breer, of course, who's the lead NFL reporter for Sports Illustrated, quote tweeted the Chiefs news and said. A few years ago, I had someone tell me a certain NFL owner didn't even like football that much. I asked, why buy a team then? Response, what other business can you buy that guarantees this kind of appreciation? And he adds to it the sentiment that fans are getting smarter about whom or what they're subsidizing. I don't think Titans fans had any kind of issue helping or through taxpayer funds, a, per, a percentage. It's not solely taxpayer funded. The the Adam Strunk family is in for a certain amount of money. The state of Tennessee uh, is putting in a certain amount of money. There is uh, a hotel motel tax that's been raised to account for a certain percentage of money. Like this is a this is a very jointly funded effort. But there is a percentage that's coming out of taxpayers. It didn't seem like Titans fans batted an eye really. I mean, they're going to be upset about their PSLs and season tickets going through the roof. But it didn't seem like the vast majority of sports fans in the national market had an issue with getting the Titans a new stadium. Now, Nissan is also different than Arrowhead. Nissan, the location of Nissan is more impactful than is the actual Nissan stadium. If it was still called Adelphia Coliseum or the Coliseum, and it is Still the original structure for the most part. They've done some things to it, but for the most part, it's a 25-year-old building that absolutely looks its age. I don't think there's the same level of attachment to Nissan as there is to Arrowhead, for example. Would you agree? Like, Nissan is not held in the same regard by Titans fans as Neyland is for Vols fans. Oh, no. No, and that's, I mean, that's history, right? Like, that's decades and generations sure. of history that's already built in. That's that's the point. Um, I'm just curious to see how different fan bases, just given that we have a stadium that is being partially subsidized here, how Titans fans feel about it when you see Kansas City vote it down resoundingly. Now, that's baseball primarily and a facelift for Arrowhead. Five, eight, $800 million in total renovations. Sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money in any by any stretch, but in terms of a stadium renovation, it's not that big a bill. Um, it was uh, Puka in the FNM Bank chat says it was people are people are tired of building stuff for billionaires, and the Hunt family doesn't love football the way that Lamar Lamar Hunt, who the trophy at the AFC Championship trophy is named after, doesn't love football the way that Lamar did. I wonder how the the Hunt family is viewed in Kansas City because their players gave them an F minus. For the ownership group. And that is after winning multiple Super Bowls. Yeah, winning cures a lot, though, in the eyes of fans. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, you can you can be the most dispassionate, cold-blooded business owner who's just out here running an NFL franchise because it appreciates like nothing else in, in business. And if you win Super Bowls, nobody's going to care. Nobody cares that Stan Kroenke doesn't seem... I, I'm not going to act like I know the man. But Stan Kroenke does not give off like good person vibes. <laughs> Have you, generally. Have you seen the tweets of the Dallas mayor? Dallas, Texas? Yes. No, I have Talking not. About the, he, he quote tweeted the NBC Sports article about the Chiefs losing the stadium renovation vote. Uh-huh. And Mayor Eric Johnson of Dallas tweeted, Welcome home, Dallas Texans. Hashtag Cotton Bowl. Oh, shut up. <laughs> yeah. Are you kidding me? That's such a funny winning position for a mayor to take. You know what? We love football here in Texas. We'll take them back. And he, accorded, this is from Channel 5 in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that reiterates that apparently he has previously stated that he has interest in bringing a second NFL team to Dallas. He did this a couple of years ago with 
Was it the Titans? I don't he remember. Was, he was out there messaging uh, the mayor of Dallas. I, I assume it's the same mayor. Was messaging about bringing another pro sports, uh, pro football franchise to Dallas. Hey, the Hunts have their roots in Texas. They they still own well, FC. So does Amy. Sure, but I'm saying they have they have st- they they still own FC Dallas. The MLS team in Dallas is oh, okay. owned by the Hunt family. Still, there's a statue of Lamar Hunt out front of Toyota Stadium down there. Coming up next, we're going to get into the latest addition to the AFC South, what the Titans are up against in Stephon Diggs and the Texans, and is he as threatening as you might have initially perceived him to be? You'll hear from Greg Cosell, some analysis coming up next.
Stephon Diggs is in the AFC South. How much does he threaten you as a Titans fan? Does he threaten you at all? Ex- exceedingly, the response has been confidence from Titans fans, wouldn't you say? And I'm, I am surprised by the amount of people who think of it as a response to the Titans trading for Legereus Sneed. That's not the way that I looked at it at all. It seemed that Corey Curtis who was in studio with us in the first hour, agreed with me as well. It's more about the Texans trying to win a Super Bowl than it is about the Titans signing Legereus Sneed. If I'm the Texans, I'm not that... I mean, maybe this is the wrong way to go about it, and I'm sure that they're worried about all their divisional opponents. But of the things that threaten you in the AFC South, how high are the Titans on the priority list for the Texans right now? In the division? Oof, that's it. I'd be fascinated at what that conversation is in Houston right now. Sure, because, I mean, you could make an argument for them being more of a threat. They look more threatening than Jacksonville right now. They're, they're making right now. moves like they believe they're more of a threat. But That's I want, the like, other thing. They like, believe they're a lot better than anybody else thinks they are. Well, you know, whatever midday show in, on Houston Sports Radio, if they do polls like we do, like if they put out a poll, who is the biggest threat to the Texans in the AFC South? Because if we did that, we know what the... <laughs> what the answer would be. Mm -hmm. But if they did that in Houston, who would finish top of the list? Jags, Titans, or Colts? I still think you give it to the Jags. Just the more, again, I don't know that Trevor Lawrence is a good quarterback. I know that he's a solid quarterback. He's been average. C.J. Stroud is already the best player at that position in the division. And we'll see what year two for him holds and for Levis and for Richardson. But old man Trevor Lawrence, heading into year four, (laughs) looking around and saying, I mean, I thought we had something here, but that fell apart pretty quickly. Man, Jags fans have to be so disheartened. They should be. Right now. Like, you just felt like the division was now yours. Like, the Titans had their run. Now it's our time, right, if you're in Jacksonville. And the way that they fumbled it last year and are sitting there watching the Texans and Titans try to build something around them, and they're just sitting there saying, well, we lost that chance to really make our mark in this division. So the Texans favored to win the division. Just uh, let, let's look up the – because the Texans – excuse me, the Colts and the Jags have the same amount of projected win totals depending on – which sports book you look at. The Titans, by any measure, no matter whether it's ESPN bet or DraftKings or wherever you're placing your futures bets, the Titans have the lowest projected win total in the AFC South. Five and a half. Five and a half on DraftKings. I saw six and a half on ESPN bet. Um, For the Colts and the Jags, they're hovering around eight and a half to seven and a half, depending on which sports book you look at, and I'm surprised that it's that high for Jacksonville. I'm surprised that it's that high for Indy. Indy is a solid football team that won nine games that was slightly better than average. Gardner Minshew, I think, was seven and six as a starter. Richardson appeared in only five games. That's the thing. The quarterback that led them to seven of those nine wins is no longer there. He's in Vegas. Who's more of an unknown right now, Richardson or Levis? Richardson. But uh, but not not by much. I mean, listen, I will will is will is interesting. Richardson is interesting. There is only a slightly smaller question mark around Will Levis than there is around Anthony Richardson right now. There's no que- there is no question that Anthony Richardson is the higher ceiling prospect, but is he going to be able to stay healthy long enough to achieve that ceiling? I have no idea. Right. That's that's where you like Joe Milton how high how high of a ceiling does Joe Milton have as a prospect? Sky high. Mm. Sky high mm. with the tools that he has. In fact, I, I think I saw Brady Quinn saying, this is not me saying Joe Milton's the best. Pr- that's, no, it, I know what you're saying. Is that not the frustration with Joe Milton? No, I know what you're saying. Like, I just, ceiling, I, I've just been through so many Joe Milton seasons I that I don't think the ceiling is that high. That, that is the conversation around Joe Milton. That's okay. why it is frustrating around Joe Milton. That's fine. Brady Quinn was on CBS the other day calling Joe Milton the most high upside prospect in this draft. And just with the tools, that's all he's talking about. And we've seen him enough to not necessarily have confidence he's going to reach that ceiling. 
But what is that conversation with Anthony Richardson? Because high ceiling, all that means is, yeah, you've got everything that it takes to be elite, but will you? So why why the golf, though? Because, all right, so let's. I'm just looking at DraftKings right now. Houston Texans to win the AFC South in the 2024 season, plus 150. Jags, plus 200. Not that far off. Colts, plus 275. All right, so if I've given you those three, plus 150, plus 200, plus 275, what do you think the Titans are? Given that their win total is right around five and a half, six and a half, I'll say plus 450. Plus 900. <laughs> 900, double it. To win the division. To win the division. To win the AFC South next season. So a $100 bet on the Titans gets you 900 bucks if they win the division in 2024. Now, I'm not going to, I don't bet on the NFL anyway for ethical concerns, but I would sure as hell tell you to bet your money on the over of five and a half. Five and a half is, I mean, hideous for how much better this team, is it simply, Vegas is too smart to not pay attention to a whole NFL football franchise. I don't know how you can look at them, see what last year's roster looked like, understand that they were still somehow able to win five or six games with it and say, no, this team is potentially worse or the same now I can look at it and say you know maybe maybe they I mean if they improve substantially though their record is going to be better than six and eleven like I could have made the case for them going seven and ten in back-to-back seasons but maybe the seven and ten in 2023 ended up looking a little better than the seven and ten did in 2022 no it turns out it wasn't it was worse who would have thunk but you can't look at the amount of turnover that the Tennessee Titans roster has had and the coaching staff. Maybe you're accounting for first year head coach as an unknown. And that's a completely fair unknown. I have no idea whether Brian Callahan is going to be good at this in theory. He should be, but that's all in theory right now. Five and a half. That's anemic. Their roster is shaping up to be better than five and a half. There's still work to be done, obviously. But so again, the centerpieces of that roster is shaping up to be better than five and a half. Yeah, I just I I count on like it's one thing for Nick Wright to get on national television and scream about the Titans are going to pick first overall in 2025. Like I care what the Titans are going to do in 2025 yet. I haven't even gotten to the 2024 draft. Chill. But it's another for Vegas, the intelligent people, to look around, see see the Tennessee Titans, see all the moves that they've made, and say five and a half wins over under. Derek says the same thing that Corey Curtis was saying. Is there is there just simply a Titans franchise bias that they're never going to be able to overcome? There are some franchises where it's earned. What's another what's what what's another franchise like the Titans, though, that gets that kind of slept on? I can't think of another one. There's either reasonable expectations about teams. There are teams who get way more credit than they deserve, i.e. the Cowboys, the Jets, teams that are perpetually hyped in the offseason that accomplish next to nothing. But what other team has this kind of inherent bias built in around it than the damn Tennessee Titans? I can't I can't think of one. It's it's not the Colts. The Colts are perpetually overhyped. I'd put them in the same category as the Cowboys almost. I understand that the Cowboys have a longer history of and also a better Super Bowl pedigree than do the Colts. The Jags' stigma around them is absolutely earned. Jacksonville has accomplished next to nothing. Steve on the FNM Bank chat says Detroit. Yeah, but how quickly did that turn for Detroit? People people weren't down on Detroit coming into this year. People weren't, I mean, mm, long. Really? Well, Joe. I, <laughs> Nobody's talking about Detroit as NFC championship contenders. I don't think that's true. I think people were very, very high on Detroit coming into last season. People were that high on Jared Goff, you think, coming into last season? No, but the rest of it around him. Because, I mean, what, what, what they wanted to see from Goff was, can you do it again? And he did it again. Any any stigma around Detroit was gone very quickly, very early on in, in, in last season. Now we can go revisit some of the... Well, we, a week one win in Kansas City will do that for you. But there were plenty of people that were picking them to win the division last year, Lucas, because what happened with Green Bay? Aaron Rodgers is gone. What happened in Chicago? I don't know if Justin Fields is worth a damn. 
Uh, what, what's going on in Minnesota? Is Kirk Cousins really going to be a threat? Maybe, but he hasn't done it in his career. People were picking Detroit regularly to win the NFC North last year. And rightfully so. That's a well-constructed team. Their, their history has been earned, though, Detroit. I'm talking about earned, earned biases. You are right to be down on the Lions if you're a longtime Lions fan. All they've done is lose and run off their best players. You are, you are right to be pessimistic if you're a Jags fan. The Jags have way more losing in their history than they do winning of consequence. I, the, the, I, I guess it's just a lack of care about the Titans as, as a franchise elsewhere other than here. Because for a long time, I just used to shrug my shoulders and say, why do you guys care so much about this stuff as Titans fans? Like, what, what, does, this, what does this do for you to, to see these slights, real or imagined, and try and, you know, and, and get all bent out of shape about it. But now I'm just confused, like just especially with Vegas. That doesn't I, make any damn sense to me. I don't think people really care about what the Panthers are doing. Panthers are probably in that category, but Burt would – I've brought this up with Burt before, and Burt will push back because he's from that area and say, no, the Panthers have a legit fan base. They've been to multiple Super Bowls. Well, yeah, sure, they have a legit fan base. The Titans have a fan base. Sure. It, but yeah, because Bert, Burt's from Carolina, so he's saying, yeah, people in Carolina care about Carolina. Okay. Yes, people in Tennessee care about Tennessee. But I almost think that Carolina – like, Cam Newton was a national story every week when he was the uh, the quarterback of the Carolina Panthers. Now, that's a that's a – brief period in the in the longer history of Panthers football and maybe I'm doing recency bias but I felt like Cam made them matter yeah but what's your point with this because I feel like all you always do is tell people yeah who gives a damn about the national narrative about your team I'm confused because I'm actually buying into it now that Vegas seems to be just completely ignoring everything that they've done like this is the first time that I've felt it John in Nashville is next hey John Hey, um, you know, part of the line that Vegas sets is based on what they think is going to happen, but most of it is about getting people to bet 50% on each side Mm -hmm. so they just collect the VIG. So I think what this reflects is less what we know as fans who follow the Titans closely and more the fact that the average NFL fan looks at us and sees Derrick Henry's gone, Tannehill's gone, Vrabel, who they thought was a good coach, is gone, and they're not seeing all the free agency moves that have been made. So I think the line is just that low to make people pull them to bet that otherwise are down on the Titans. I know I'm going to go out and bet on that uh, 900, uh, plus 900 to win the division because I think we can see the improvement that the rest of the country doesn't. No, for sure. 615-737-1045 615-737-1045 is the number. Thanks for chiming in there, John. So, Texans think they're going to push for a Super Bowl. They're totally capable of it. How much does Stephon Diggs put them over the edge? Well, I was asking Greg Cosell yesterday. We did a new episode of the install, and obviously Diggs is huge news. So, we opened the show with that before we did a little interior offensive line scouting. And I asked him about Stephon Diggs in the context of working with Tank Dell and Nico Collins. He's uh, he's now sort of in some ways. Well, not he's not the best. I'm not going to say he's the best. Sure, he's prototypical as far as what we call the boundary X. That single receiver to the short side of the field that can win one on one. That can run multiple route concepts. They get a lot of man to man coverage. He can get vertical. He can run crossers. He can run away from coverage. Um, and quite honestly, because. You know, Stefan Diggs, and I know people probably have a sense of Diggs as being big time, but Diggs has declined a little bit. Mm -hmm. He is not a number one anymore. In fact, he may be the number three receiver there. He's certainly not going to get the same uh, target volume that he got in Buffalo, which, of course, had declined pretty significantly. Um, And he'll be 31 during the course of this season. So um, he's getting a little older. But in the situation now in Houston, he doesn't have to be you know, the so-called number one, he's not going to be. And we saw what Tank Dell did last year. Uh, so they've got a really nice trio. And they've, and they've got Dell and Diggs, who are, are both movable chess pieces within the context of an offense. So I continue to look at Stephon Diggs more as them, more at as the Houston hedging their bets against however long it might take Tank Dell to look right after a fractured leg injury. But to hear Cosell describe him that way, 
Do you do you still think of Stephon Diggs as all pro wide receiver or aging asset who's no longer what he once was? No, all pro caliber. Yeah, you still think of him? Yes, in that, I do. That yeah. those terms. Uh, other than the, well, you concede though that his his play has dropped off. It's dropped off, but his production hasn't that much. Well, he's the only one they're worth giving volume sure. to. Still putting up those numbers. I mean, he if not for the off field stuff. Do you think Stephon Diggs would still be a Buffalo Bill? No, not at that price tag. I think I think there's a variety of different reasons why it was easy for them to move on from Stephon. If Diggs. Stephon Diggs was not a problem off the field, you you don't think the Bills would have kept him and not eaten thirty million dollars of dead money for him to not play for them? Yeah, I mean, it, he can be. If you want to do it as cut and dry as that, if he has zero issues whatsoever, if he's a model citizen and and, and has no attitude problems about whatever the case may be, then yeah, they probably figure out a way to keep him around. There's been enough reporting out of Buffalo about their patience wearing thin with Stephon that I feel good about saying Stephon Diggs would still be a Buffalo Bill if not for those issues. Now, how they deploy him in Houston is going to be differently. Um, he's going to he's going to be a movable piece for them in the same way that Cosell described. I think that a lot of a lot of his route uh, a lot of the route concepts that they're going to run with him are going to be more intermediate to short than trying to make him a vertical threat, as you just heard Cosell articulate, because that is that is the area that I notice. Stephon Diggs used to be a deep threat, used to be able to legitimately stretch the field. I don't feel like he does that for Buffalo's offense anymore, as quite as well. But he doesn't have to in Houston. Tank Dell theoretically should be able to do that. How healthy is Tank Dell? We'll have to wait until September to find out. Derek is in Spring Hill up next. Hey, Derek. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Good. Good. Hey, listen, big, I'm, a, I'm a big Bills fan. I, I like the show. You guys are great, uh, so I follow the Titans some. But, yeah, um, Buck, your take on Diggs is right. He, he's no longer a deep threat. And if you go back and look at the last – Two-thirds of the season, the last 13 games last year, he's first in the team in targets but third in yards. Mm. Um, scored two touchdowns in the last 13 games. And the, in the elimination games in the playoffs, he has been completely non-existent uh, despite throwing as many tantrums as he wants to. So I think it's a combination. Even if the off-field stuff didn't exist, I don't think he'd be a bill given the fact that they can move on and clear so much money next year in the cap. It's only costing $2 million more this year. To not have him on the team. Thanks for the call. Does that change your? That's I mean that's a Bills fan. That's somebody who's watching him more regularly than uh, you or I. Yeah, that that kind of tells me they're trying to get him the ball. And like you're saying, there were not really any other major consistent threats on the Bills roster this year. Not wide receiver. So wise. I don't want to blindly look at. Well, he disappears in the postseason. Well, that's who defenses are devoting their attention to. And I think that should worry you when it comes to him now joining a roster with Nico Collins and Tank Dell and Dalton Schultz and Noah Brown in a competent run game with a good offensive line. Last call for Fungus. Are the already the uh, end of the show? That's crazy. Oh, by the way, Monday, this coming Monday, we're going to be out at Two Rivers Ford, all four, four shows. Even Burt is going. I can't believe they let Burt out of the studio to go to a live event. Uh, with the rest of us. But we are all going to be broadcasting live from Two Rivers Ford out in Mount Juliet all day long on the day of the eclipse. It also happens to be the first day uh, that the Titans report, though there will not be media availability until the 10th. So I'll be out at Two Rivers Ford. And National Championship Game Day on the men's side. So you can join us as we broadcast live all day from Two Rivers Ford in Mount Juliet on Monday, April the 8th. For more info, Visit 1045thezone.com slash events today. I know they're going to have giveaways. I know they're going to have eclipse glasses for people. And cars. And cars. You want to test drive a car? You want to see what it's like to whip around a, a, an Explorer the way that Coach Mack does? Or one of these monster uh, F-250 super duties that Ramon drives? Or uh, I don't know what Hopkins whips from Two Rivers. but I don't trust myself in an F-250. I don't trust you in a vehicle. <laughs> I feel like my depth perception would be way out of whack. It would, it would be like, yeah, I could fit in there, just crush an entire hood of a car. I, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe don't come out to Two Rivers if you have plan, designs on monster trucking around the lot. <laughs> but if you would like to safely test drive a vehicle that is well within your uh, capabilities to do so, don't worry. Lucas will not be anywhere near the vehicles. They've got Ford Escapes, too. That's more up my alley.
Well, sure, you are also a member of the Ford family. Though, again, I do not trust you behind the wheel of any vehicle. Built Ford tough. <laughs> that shut applies up. to all Fords, right? Just, not just trucks. Just shut up and go to break. <laughs>
We got Phil Forsberg on the radio show tomorrow. Preds have a big game against the Blues tonight. Why was that so much easier for me off the top of the live radio show than it was trying to make that promo during the commercial break, Lucas? What the hell is that? Do you have that problem? Oh, yeah. Yeah, recorded stuff is always, for whatever reason, so much harder than live stuff when it's just off the rip. So dumb. Anyway, Phil Very will be here. We'll see if the Preds can't get off the schneid tonight against a conference opponent. That would be of great value as they continue their postseason push. April the 15th is their last regular season game before the Stanley Cup playoffs get here. So we'll look forward to hanging out with Forsberg tomorrow morning at some point. And Coach Mack will also be a part of the proceedings. Titans offseason, their their report day is Monday, April 8th, the, the day of the eclipse. Um, That gives me hives, the idea that there is already going. We're already going to have Titans practices in some form or fashion The first one that's open to the media is on the 10th. Nobody pretends to hate their job more than you. You know that? (laughs) Gives you hives. It does give me hives. You don't don't get that about soccer season when it starts to get close and you just get anxiety? Now, I understand that you're slightly more prepared about things than I am. I get giddy. I get excited. Don't get hives. I I legitimately get hives. It's like, this is... I, th- I think you're the unrelatable one here. This is my version of the Sunday scaries. Now, we don't have a normal job. I don't get Sunday scaries about coming into work on a Monday because I work most Sundays, or not most Sundays, but a lot of Sundays. And so by the time I come in here on Monday, Monday feels like a Wednesday to me. The idea that football practices or fir- their first report day is April the 8th is my version of football season scaries. That doesn't mean that I hate it. It just means that I'm scrambling around because I don't feel prepared for a football season to start on April the damn 8th. Anyway, uh, Trippin' Titan says, can we donate to get Buck to stare into the eclipse? In fact, you can. Uh, You can donate to LLS, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and I'll put my glasses on and stare into the eclipse on Monday at Two Rivers Ford. How much for you to look directly into it with no glasses? Um, I would say at least $1,000. In you fact, heard the man. It's for cancer. If I'm going, Lucas, do me the courtesy of dropping the uh, LLS link in the chat for people who are willing to donate to a uh, search for a cure for blood cancers and also to have me look straight into an eclipse. So if a thousand. I'm just kidding for the lawyers who are out there listening to us, waiting to pounce on us after the hot chip challenge. I'm not kidding. So if a thousand dollars in donations come in today, you will glare directly into the eclipse. No glasses. No, no, no. One, if if one person, I need a donation the size of $1,000. I don't need multiple donations equaling $1,000, although I will take those two. Okay. But it, it needs to be one donation of $1,000 for me to stare directly at the eclipse. Allegedly. Potentially. We'll see. Don't put it in writing. <laughs> Uh, So if you could uh, do that for me, Lucas, I would appreciate it. We are raising money for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. If you're unaware, I'm a part of their Visionaries of the Year campaign. Uh, We're on the back half of that, and the install is going to be our main fundraising event for that. We'll have QR codes for you guys at the tables and whatnot. Uh, I'm going to have a very special guest uh, speak about the cause that we are raising money for and a couple of other events that we're having some of our friends help us out with well as well to continue to uh, raise money. Harold Hockett says, Buck, please know your eyesight is not worth it. Not worth finding a cure for cancer, Harold? Really? You're right, it's not. I want to hang on to my eyesight. <laughs> um, but it is a great cause. Your donations are welcome. We uh, eclipsed the $1,000 mark last week, so nice. I think we can continue to build upon that. You uh, are uh, still short of the over million dollars that uh, all those kids raised in the LLS Student Visionaries of the Year finale. Well, I'm still trying to figure out how the hell Hutton made 140 grand off this thing a couple of years ago. Like, that's the dude is unbelievable <laughs> when it comes to that kind of stuff. Uh, so I am uh, doing the best that I can, but we're going to continue to raise some money for this as that continues throughout the course of the next month. Big game tonight. Important, it feels like, to get two points tonight before hitting the road to play the Islanders and Devils with the regular season coming to a close. 7 p.m. puck drop against the Blues at home. Polls, please. Not now, Jenny. I'm on the radio. Buck Rising gave me a job. Said something about a poll update. Hope that wasn't at that club where you became a folk singer. Anyway, Buck Rising's producer... And correspondent has the final poll update. I'm not a smart man, but I know who Lucas Panzeca is. 
Presented by Two Rivers Ford, the South's most trusted Ford dealer. What is your lowest priority position for the Titans in the draft? CT says running back. Yeah, it feels like running back's probably the right answer there. Safety is probably second. You could argue tight end or corner. We did not mention quarterback. A few people in the chat are saying quarterback. That probably will not be addressed in the upcoming draft. You don't know. I don't know. Uh, but I probably Wouldn't that be know. Great at seven. Let's have <laughs> let's have some fun. Last year I rooted for chaos and I wanted them to draft Will Levis. I got my wish. This year I'm also rooting for chaos. Let's go quarterback at seven. Who should be the Titans kick returner? John and Goody say Kiaris Jackson. Yeah, I don't know what what the that ankle injury had to be pretty gnarly to keep him out from preseason until the end of the uh, through the rest of the year. Uh, so we'll see what he looks like come training camp because he's still under contract here. Kenneth says Kyle Phillips, but Kyle Phillips never returned kicks. No. Jay says Tajay Spears. No mention of Tony Pollard. I'm kind of good with letting Tajay ride it out, honestly, the more that I think about it, especially since you have Pollard and Spears. I'm what good with that. Sh- what should Texans fans' biggest concerns be about Stephon Diggs? Karen says injuries. I don't think he's been a an unavailable player over the years. No. I mean, but, you know, I unless you're talking just generally as he gets older. Yeah. Uh, Jay says locker room issues. Charlie says the fact that he is declining and a malcontent while getting 160 targets a year. Yeah, it's that one. <laughs> it's the last one. <laughs> Who has the best skill position group in the AFC South? 64% say the Texans. 34% say the Titans. 1% Colts. 1% Jags. It's definitely between Titans and Texans. What was the question? The best skill position group in the division. Oh, yeah. You wouldn't take the Colts or the the Jags. No. I mean, the Jags are running out there with Gabe Davis and yeah. Christian Kirk. It's the trio of receivers that the Texans have are better. But would, could you argue that Ridley and D-Hop is a better one-two punch than Collins and Diggs? At Maybe. receiver? Maybe. Yes, well, no, at another position. <laughs> I don't know. You didn't say anything. I, I was thinking I, I, about it. It sounded like you were pondering. It's okay. It's a, it's a little bit of dead air is not going to kill you. Are the Texans Super Bowl contenders? 53% say yes, which means 47% say no. Mm. Are they the biggest challenger to the Chiefs in the AFC East in a conversation that is very premature, pre-draft, but could we say that right now? AFC East? Uh, in the AFC, excuse me. I don't know why I said East. Uh, are they the biggest challenger to the Chiefs? Do we think that they have surpassed the Ravens no. at this point in the offseason? No. Although Baltimore, Baltimore's roster on both sides of the ball is going to look a lot different. The The offensive line is going to be remade. The defense, they are constantly replacing people even though they brought back Matt Abike. Um I'd, I'd still take Baltimore. They've got the most threatening quarterback in it, at, out of anybody at this point. And while Stroud is great, I don't know that he's Lamar yet. Those are the polls. Excellent. That's the show. Uh, make sure you uh, can check out the install, the newest episode. We talked about Stephon Diggs and the Texans. We broke down some interior offensive line prospects that are upcoming in the draft class. You're going to want to know a good deal about those. Make sure you keep it right here. Blaine and Mickey going to keep you entertained. Coming up next.